Hi, Misha here, and this is yet another look at Japanese armor. Still looking at some things from the Imperial era, World War II. And in video one, we started with this tank, the Type 95 light tank. Had a crew of three, had a relatively low velocity 37 millimeter gun, two 7.7 millimeter machine guns, but it did have a high top speed of also light armor. And today we're going to look at a closely related tank, the Type 2. Call me. Now, the Type 95 and the Type 97 were pretty much the two mass produced tanks in World War II by Japan. From this point on, we're looking at pretty small production numbers. So when I say that only about 184 of these Type 2s were made, that might sound like a tiny number, and in some aspects it is, but compared to some other Japanese tanks, you know, at least they built some, and this did see combat between 1942 and 1945. And as you can tell, it's an interesting tank. In fact, this was the Japanese Navy's first and really only, nearly so, amphibious tank. And it's often considered to be the best amphibious tank that anyone had in World War II. So with that, let's, uh, let's talk about how the Type 95 was turned into the Type 2. And some of it's pretty interesting and even cool features. Both Type 2 Kami models are from Dragon. And this is the one with its pontoons, as it would be swimming. The Japanese first expressed interest with the army in floating tanks, or special landing tanks, in 1928. So throughout the 1930s, the army had several one-off or two-off prototypes and concepts. These were, generally speaking, under the SR series, SR1, SR2, etc., and they were more or less loosely based on the Vickers floating tank, which Russia had its own things. So look at the video I did in the past on the T-37 and T-38, and later T-40 for that. So this idea of a aquatic tank, well, it, it goes back. But in Russia, they really wanted a, a tank just across rivers, maybe lakes. The Russian ones were not ever meant to be seaworthy. But Japan, they wanted something that could support landings and the like, so it needed to be able to go out to the open ocean. Uh, that's a, a much taller order. It, I have to say the Pacific is a little milder, generally speaking, than the Atlantic, generally speaking. But still yet, yeah, taking a tank onto the ocean is precarious. Well, what the army came up with, some of their smallest versions were under four tons. Their heaviest ones were about seven tons. These were two-man, sometimes three-man tanks, and really only fitted with machine guns, which were very clearly just not enough to be worth anything. So they abandoned their efforts in the late 30s as they were getting more and more engaged in China, and therefore the Navy picked up the project. This was going to be for their special landing forces. Think of it as uh, Japanese Marines, for lack of a better term. There would also be a naval armor detachment wing, if you will. So kind of two groups within the Japanese Navy needed a tank. And the project was handed over to Mitsubishi. They looked at what the Army had done, where they succeeded and where they failed. Then they looked at the new Type 95 tank and got to work. And they introduced the floating tank Type 1. This was really just a prototype, but it was a good test in 1941 for the Type 2 here, introduced and put into production in 1942, and actually even saw combat late that year. So, for a comparison here's the original type 
95 and a type 2 with the floats. At first they may not look all that similar. The type 2 has several many 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 changes but it uses the same suspension, the bell crank. It uses the same chassis, the same engine, the same transmission, the same drivetrain. It even uses a very similar gun. This is the Type 1 37 millimeter gun, so same millimeter, but it is a higher velocity variant, trying to squeeze a little more oomph out of this, uh, out of this gun. That's why it is noticeably longer here by a little bit. And both have two 7.7 millimeter machine guns. We'll look at it on this one later. It's buried under the pontoon at the moment. So it has it in the front, but whereas this one has the odd positioning in the sort of rear, sort of side of the turret, this one is actually coaxially located with the main gun. That's because this has a wholly different hull and a wholly different turret design compared to the 95. And that's where the differences start. The 95 here was created using riveting and welding. The Type 2 was an all welded construction. This was done to help make it watertight. And where that wasn't enough, they used rubber seals and rubber gaskets because they wanted this, they needed this to be as watertight as possible. And when that wasn't possible, it even had a bilge pump to, uh, to drain it. Pretty neat. They also added what was effectively a very small bridge on top of the turret here for navigating in the water. To propel it in the water, it had two propellers. That's what, that's what they typically do. And even two rudders to steer it. To kind of integrate things better, the bell crank system was made internal where it was an external system on the little 95. Now this is a larger tank. With the pontoons, you're looking at about 7.4 meters compared to about 4.4 for the 95. Without the pontoons, you're looking at about 4.8 meters. It's also heavier. With everything here, we're at about 12.3 tons, so almost as much as the original Type 97. If we drop the pontoons, that drops down to about 9.2 tons. So still heavier than this at 7.4 tons. One thing, though, that I think is quite interesting, the Type 95 had a crew of three, and it was quite cramped in here. Well, our Type 2 has a crew of five. Yeah, it's a little bigger, but boy, they had to get cozy. You had the driver, the machine gunner, you had the commander, gunner, and you had his assistant who could double as a loader or whatever. And our fifth member, interestingly, was a mechanic. In case it broke down in the water, there's no one else out there to help you. Yeah. Also, in case it broke down in the water, this was really the first Japanese tank that went into anything like mass production that had a radio as a standard feature. Again, other ones before could have radios if they were command tanks, but... And before that, it wasn't a common. It also had an intercom inside so the crew could easily communicate even if they were in high seas and it was going on loud outside. There were just lots of little changes. For example, the, the road wheels had drain holes in case when it comes out of the water. And just li little neat things you might not think of. And it was a pretty capable tank in some aspects. It was seaworthy. The 95 here got up to about 43 to 45 miles per hour on road. Because of the additional weight and everything, this was a little slower at about 37 to 38 kilometers. I think I said miles here. I apologize. Kilometers. This was about 37 to 38 kilometers per hour. 
on the land, and it could get up to about 10 kilometers on the water. That might sound slow, but later Russian designs like the uh, BMP and BMD were slower than that. So that was a pretty good speed, all things considered. And its range did not suffer much. Uh, it had a range of about 170 on land, and that dropped down to about 140 in the water. So enough that it could be dropped off by a ship and, you know, get where it needed to go. It really was a well-thought-out amphibious tank. It wasn't something kind of slapped together at the last minute. Yeah. It really did have a lot of vessel nautical references and things on it and in it the way it was treated. And because of the rudders and dual propellers, it had pretty good redundancy. With these pontoons, they were even pretty thoughtful. They were steel-plated on the outside. The rear was just essentially one pontoon. But the front had a major divide. It was essentially two sections. But on top of that, each section was divided into three subsections. So a total of six cells here. That's so if one got hit, or even two got hit by enemy fire, the whole thing would not flood and it wouldn't just go under. Plus again, bilge pump. Yeah, they really thought this would help them invade islands by surprise, or if there weren't adequate port or dock facilities, they could come on. Unfortunately, they were not ready in 1941 when Japan was making its first moves. For example, in the Philippines, they would use some Type 95s, but they would have to use special barges to land them because they did not have any floating tanks available. No, they wouldn't really come around until 1942, and pretty late in that year they would start to appear. Uh, you would first see fighting on Guadalcanal. They would see some use there. And then they would put them in mass production between 1942 and 1943. But this was always meant to be a specialist tank. Supply never met demand. And that's because a lot of the components were either custom made or custom modified. And a lot of things were custom hand fitted. These were not set up for mass assembly line production, even by Japanese standards. So they never had enough of these. It's said that the Japanese Navy had roughly 220, give or take, amphibious tanks. Of these, yeah, 182 were standard production Type 2s with another couple of pre-production test models. So the vast majority of their aquatic tank fleet, yeah, this is what we had. It was supposed to be replaced by the Type 3 and later Type 5, but these are just concepts that never went into production. As far as production, this was it. And they only built these in 1942 and 1943. But service would last through the war, of course. Here we have the other version. When they hit land, there was a switch inside that would release a series of clips that would allow the uh, pontoons to come off, and then presumably the accoutrement on top of the turret would be taken off as well. You can see here how the suspension system is internalized the, to the design. Like I said, when the pontoons are off, it's only about 9.2 tons and about 4.8 meters long. Well, by the time these were available, the whole concept... Japan was basically no longer invading islands. So these ended up being stationed by different naval bases and garrison units throughout the southeast and what have you. So they ended up being used in 1943 and 44 mostly as standard light tanks. With the pontoon off the front, you can see the uh, second 7.7 millimeter machine gun mounted here. And of course, coaxially on the front with the main gun. 
these would be encountered during the Solomons, and they would be encountered at Marianas Islands, and they would be featured at Leyte Gulf, at Leyte Battle of the Philippines in 1944. And there they were used in their amphibious role, or at least they, they tried to. The uh, effort was in vain. Even though it's probably apocryphal and never happened, there is a story that some Type 2s and American LVTs engaged each other on the water with their guns. If this were to have happened, this would have been the only tank engagement by floating pieces of armor, although the LVT is not considered a tank, of course, or LTV. But anyway, this would have been the first time and only time in history this happened, where two pieces of armor shot at each other while floating around. Again, probably didn't happen, but it's a neat uh, neat story nevertheless. Production was over. The need for a floating tank was long gone. But in 1945, the surviving ones were either gathered back to protect naval installations on the home islands or were dug in as pillboxes. I think by now you kind of get the drift. To this end, a number were captured by not only the USA, but also Australian troops captured some. And of all things, Russian troops actually captured a handful. So, yeah, they were kind of scattered about. Again, this is another dragon model, just without its pontoons. This would have been defending a naval base. Again, they were originally made for the Special Landing Forces or the armored division of the Navy. And they were in some ways superior to the Type 95 in combat. But where they shown was their ability to handle the seas. I just still can't imagine getting five men in this. That would have been um, interesting. Let's wrap this up. And here the two versions are side by side just for comparison. Just to show you how much is added by the pontoons. Quite a bit of weight and everything else. Just one of those very creative Japanese things that uh, really wasn't needed by the time it came around. And this will start to be a very repeated theme. Of course, if they had had these in, in larger numbers in 1941, they might have found them quite useful. I'm not saying it would have changed the war, of course not. But for them, it would have been a nice thing to have at that time. But by the time... The Type 2 was available, the need was very small. Any other piece of armor would have worked the same. And as always, of course, all these different projects and programs drained resources from producing other things. These models from Dragon are unfortunately just plastic. I wish they were true die cast, but again, beggars really cannot be choosers for Japanese tanks, much as you can't be for Japanese planes from World War II. Oh well, still nicely done, and they have several versions, and they do have some good weight to it for being plastic. These, unlike the 95 and 97, are uh, screwed on to their stands. Of course, you can easily remove them with a, with a screwdriver if you need to. The turrets do move, but they are very stiff. But I wanted to show you this because the Japanese Navy is quite interesting. It's neat to see a tank in their employ. They did have some Type 95s and even a handful of Type 97s that they used as well. But this was their tank and their project. And it was, as far as I know, only produced by Mitsubishi. And there you have it. Let me know what you think. Appreciate you tuning in. Hope you're enjoying these Japanese tanks, uh, pieces of armor. Got a few more to show you, and then we'll move into the modern JG SDF era with uh, their Cold War tanks. But this is Misha, and I'll catch you very soon next time.